Welcome to the Spiritual Forum, everyone. I'm so glad you're here. I'm here with great, great people today. I'm really excited. But first, let me tell you just a little bit, just a few little things. Um, I've been reminding people about the retreat that I'm leading at Unity Village, Missouri. And that is a retreat. It's called Whole Planet Spirituality. And the title is Peace Begins With Me. And it really is all about aligning our words, actions, values, and feelings all in alignment. So we have inner peace and vegans, vegetarians, omnivores, everybody is welcome. And I hope you come. This is our third year. If you're not part of the newsletter, please subscribe at the spiritualform.org. And that's where you can find out information about the retreat, make a donation and all that kind of stuff. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And let me introduce my guests. They are Paul and Lauren Bell. Paul and Lauren Bell are devoted to conscious parenting, right livelihood, modeling an ethical relationship between our food choices and the natural world, and intentionally building community grounded in the fundamental knowledge of natural law. Paul is a certified yoga teacher. He's been a chef and culinary expert for over 30 years and is committed to preparing only organic plant-based cuisine. Lauren is a nature philosopher, also learning to work in the visionary realm, studying world spiritualities, astrology, working with animal messengers, plant spirit shamanism, and echo psychology, and she's certified to teach permaculture design. But together, they are the founders of truthloveandfreedom.com, a platform for activism, teaching natural law, morality, and voluntarism. And they are also the founders of Blue Hill Farm Organics. Um, both of these uh, activities operate from their certified organic permaculture farm in Southern California. They're producing fruit orchard and diverse food gardens to feed their family, friends, and now a greater community with fruit juices and their mobile restaurant. There's so much more to, to say about Paul and Lauren, and I'm just going to say welcome, guys. Thanks. So, so glad to be here. Thanks for inviting us. Yeah, it's it's great. It's great, great, great to have you. And, you know, I found you, as I mentioned, I found you on a post and um, and kind of kind of ran you down and real excited that that we're we're meeting together. Um, uh, today, because I love everything you're doing, and I really want to have conversations about natural law. Cool. I'm a beginner yeah. in natural law, but I I'm so inspired by it, and I'm really looking forward to talking about natural law, and voluntarism, and permaculture. And if we get a chance, we'll get to talk about homeschooling too. <laughs> cool. So anyway, could you just kind of start by giving me? Um, you know, what, what's your message? What's your background? How did you get to what you're doing today? Um, I, this is a spiritual podcast. So whether you talk about spiritual things or not, if you're, if you're walking your authentic path, you're on the spiritual path. And so, um, so just tell me about a little bit about your background, how you got here. Yeah. Well, um, part of what really inspired us was, you know, we've, we've both done a lot of studies in different areas. And, uh, when we first got together, we started studying the work from Mark Passio and it was really inspiring. It took all of the different ideas that I had been working with over the years in my education um, and, and kind of packaged it nicely with a little bow and it made it seem so simple. Um, and so that was just really inspiring to both of us. And at first it was just the learning and we dove right down into it and try to get as much out of those podcasts as we possibly could. And at a certain point, we were both feeling really like, okay, well now what do we do with all of this? And um, as we had said before, Mark Passio is, is, he really pushes people and that's his, he wants that. He wants to get people motivated to do something. And so we both felt at a certain point that it was our moral obligation, our moral and spiritual obligation to take action. And so we started with just writing things and talking to people and forming our website. It started, Lauren put together a little brochure about natural law um, that we started to hand out at events we would go to and just have conversations with people. We put together a little uh, kind of a quiz, like uh, something to just start conversations where we'd walk up to groups and ask them questions about morality and things like that. And just kind of sit back and let the conversation happen and just kind of see what mm -hmm. you could spark in a group of people that wanted to talk. And it was pretty inspiring. And pretty quickly after that, we said, okay, we need a website for this. We need to put this on there and like have some kind of a, a basis for this. 
and we started brainstorming name, names, writing down all the concepts that are important to us and truth, love, and freedom obviously came to the top, but I was like, well, that website's already taken truth, love, truth, love, freedom.com is already taken, but truth, love, and freedom.com mm -hmm. was available. <laughs> uh, and I couldn't believe it. So I got it and, uh, we put together did the art for it. And basically all that was on it was the brochure that we had made the pamphlet. Yeah. Well, that was the website. And then we kind of grew from there. We had lived in Laguna beach and a little over three years ago, uh, her father started looking, um, for some, some other properties, we made a big move into the mountains about an hour away from Laguna Beach and got a farm uh, and changed our lives completely. And that's where all of the all of the other projects and all the other things kind of just started to, yeah. to fall into place because we our lifestyle changed so much. And Lauren, with her background with the permaculture design, uh, I was still working for a restaurant uh, serving animals, uh, which I did for oh, my whole career. <laughs> um, I, I'd worked for a steakhouse for 20 years. I worked for seafood companies. And so uh, even though we had children and decided um, after we had children, we made the final move that we weren't gonna eat animals anymore because it seemed very hard to teach a child that we're kind to animals and we treat animals well, unless we're hungry and then we can do whatever we like to them. And so it was very obvious that we needed to do that. but uh, I had some cognitive dissonance and had a really good career that I was successful at and, and enjoyed to, in most parts and continued for a couple of years working in the restaurants. Um, and then we, uh, I went to pick up my four-year-old son. At, he was, he'll be seven next month, but he was four at the time at his preschool. And his teacher said, hey, do you want me to tell you what uh, I asked the kids what their dads do for work? And do you want me to tell you what your son Aro told me today? And I was like, well, sure. And she said, uh, he told me that my dad goes to a restaurant where they kill animals so people can eat them, even though he knows it's wrong. And that last part was like a knife in my stomach. Uh, it, I literally almost threw up right then and was just like, oh my God, like, what am I doing? Uh, and yeah. immediately changed my, my whole life. I, I went to work and told them that I had to leave, that I was no longer going to be be working for them. They offered to move me to the marketing oh, department so or to, to, to human them. resources or to anything. And I was like, oh, you don't understand. Actually, I did say, I said, I'll be happy to stay with you if you change your menu and you only see your serve organic <laughs> and plant-based food. And he said, well, we can't do that. And I was like, I know, that's why I'm leaving. Um, and so we figured we had to try to figure out kind of how to make all this work and support our family at the farm here. So that's where the Blue Hill Farm Organics came in. We started juicing some of the citrus on our trees. Uh, we started our, our mobile organic restaurant. It's called Ahimsa Bowls, which Ahimsa is a Sanskrit word for, for no harm. It's part of the eight limb path of yoga. And so everything we do with our restaurant is organic. It's plant-based. We use all like plant-based and, and biodegradable um, plates and silverware. And um, um, when we can, we do farm to table from our farm, some of the ingredients and for the food in the restaurant. And our main customers, we go to music festivals and concerts and places. So we've always been big um, concert people. And so there's a big community of people out there. And what we realize is that these people are going out to these places in a lot of cases, they're taking substances that are opening up their consciousness and they're, they're in, a, in a state that could be fragile at times. And that when we come and we bring our energy and our light and our, our bright, healthy food, it can give them that option of that to put into their body and use that for their nourishment, that it has a ripple effect that's, that's really profound. And we see that it's, it's different than just taking food and serving it somewhere, that these people need this, that it's like meeting a, a real need, like on the soul level for, for their nourishment. And it, it seems like it really is the path of where we need to be kind of our niche right now. So that's where we're focusing on with that. And it gives us an opportunity to teach natural law. We have yeah. our Truth, Love, and Freedom banner up. We have our brochure out there, and we have lots of great conversations with people. And it's a, it's kind of it all, it all works together in a real symbiotic uh, way. Well, that's pretty darn awesome. Okay, all right. So there's a lot going on there. I think <laughs> I, I, I love what your son said. I love the way you know children just kind of come right out and <laughs> tell the truth. Yeah. And adults, we have so much trouble with telling the truth. You know, we have, we yeah. have all these ways to contort ourselves in a million different ways in order to justify our actions, and and our and our thoughts and our feelings. And you know, we just we just there's a thousand reasons we have for what we do. And the kids like, no, nah, my dad's doing this, even though he knows it's wrong. Wow. Right. 
that's the part that hurt. You know, that was the sure. part where I'm like, wow, I'm doing all this work teach them right and wrong and teach them about morality and teach them all these things. But yet he's just watching my example every day and saying, well, he says this, but this is what he does. <laughs> yeah. Match, so. Yeah. Well, good for him. Um, I want to jump into uh, natural law. I'd like for you to explain to listeners who are really unfamiliar with natural law, kind of what that is. And um, you've mentioned morality a couple of times. I just want to say it's interesting that modern people have challenges with that word morality you know oh, it's lot. like i know moral you're 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 you're, you're uh, high and mighty your time to do it's church religion you know all of this and oh. so because of that it's just so clear that we don't want to face it and i mean even in like i'm an ordained unity minister and i have to say that i don't know if you know much about unity but morality isn't really a part of the unity movement and it's something that's so missing. People are afraid to talk about what what do we need to be, what do we need to do to be moral people, because it has all this judgment and all this judginess and everything. So I really want to talk about morality and how natural law is about morality and how this is really, really a good positive thing for humanity. So can you just share a little bit about how you know how would you describe natural law? A basic. Before we go to it, I want to I want to just touch on the morality piece because. I think it's important. But that's the found at the foundation of natural law is that morality is objective. It is what it is. It doesn't change based on your perspective, what you believe, what you think you know, what feels good. And that kind of goes to that thing that you're saying about people. We tell ourselves the stories we want to tell to keep doing what's comfortable. And so what the the biggest shocker for us when we were going around doing our survey and asking people questions, when we get to that question, we just say, is is morality objective or subjective? Objective. It does it does it matter what the circumstances are, or is it can an action be judged on what the action is and not take all that into into play? And most people say that it's subjective, that it's just based on my feelings and my experience. And if I decide that something is moral, then it becomes moral, and that's a huge problem. Uh, natural law tells us that that's not the case. Um, so, so you want to talk about natural law? A basic definition would be that it is a set of unchangeable, immutable, immutable. Um, ever present set of rules basically that govern our behaviors and actions in the world. You could call it karma. There's a lot of different ways you can kind of describe it. Um, but basically, what you do to others will be done to you. That's the golden rule. The That's golden the, rule. The, the primary rule. And there's there's a lot of there's a lot of traditions that kind of package up natural law and put it in a different way so if you look into like like the hermetic principles and hermeticism it goes deep into to, to to a lot of those things where you talk about like the law of correspondence and the law of rhythm and the generative principle and all these things that, that exist that these are all aspects of natural law these are these are things that are this is the way that it works this is this is what it is uh, natural law tells us that there is such a thing as truth with a capital T. It is what has happened. It is what is. It's not your truth and it's not my truth and it's not our truth. It's the truth. And so that's like one of the, the like main principles as, as if you're a truth seeker, if you're somebody who's who's wanting to understand the truth, you start by having to, to accept the fact that there is such a thing as truth. Mm -hmm. Because if there is no no truth, then why are you a truth seeker? What is it that you're seeking? And there's nothing that you can find. And so you, you start with that first idea that there is truth. There is truth out there. It can be found. It is what has happened. There are a lot of other truth seekers who have done work before us who we can look at their work and we can see the body of what it is that they've shared. Uh, there's a lot of esoteric um, writings out there. There's a lot of super valuable truth in a lot of religions, you know, in a lot of religious texts. They're, they're full of very powerful, profound, capital T truths. Uh, what we find is that unfortunately, because people get involved in a lot of aspects of religion, that there tends to be be aspects that we don't feel aligned with capital T truth and that kind of get skewed along the way. And so that's why we consider ourselves more on the spiritual aspect of this truth search and not the religious aspect of it. And that we, we respect people's beliefs, but that we also understand that there's parts about all of it that don't really all go together and tie in because there's some some aspect there that's trying to take some of the control and the power it could be the institution it could be the, the people that are are involved in it you know but that uh, we have direct connection to source and that we can get these truths of natural law um, ourselves and we don't need 
the the structure and the institutions to um, allow us access to that stuff. And something that I would say, just short to add to that, is that you know, as the law, the natural law is very simple, um, and people <laughs> want to build up everything to be so complicated, but it's so simple. And you really to understand like morality, what it's not asking, okay, well, what can I do? What are good actions? Because you can do so many things that are good because they're not gonna cause harm to people. It's more important to boil down this understanding to what is a wrong? What is it that's actually a wrong action? And it all comes down to one thing, do not steal. Every form of wrong we can consider is a form of theft. Whether it's murder and you're stealing someone's life, it's rape and you're stealing their sexual energy, it's theft and they're stealing your possessions. Lying, um, stealing, lying the truth. stealing the truth. And we can go on from there. Uh, but it's it's really very simple. Thank you. It it is it is very simple. So let me um let me let me back up on some of this stuff because I want to go back to that there is one truth. This is something that spiritual people really have trouble with. I think, <laughs> really have trouble with because they, I, I I I think that there's a difference between we all have different perceptions of reality, and that is true. <laughs> we all have different perceptions of reality. We can all look at the same thing and have a different filter and different perception about what just happened, but there is a a truth. <laughs> Um, regardless of our filters, our perceptions, our beliefs, everything that we're filtering reality through, uh, it's not the same as saying that we all that there are different truths. I, I, I believe that is what we're saying here. So I like to use the capital T and the little T, but I like to say like, you know, your, your truth mm -hmm. is the little T truth. That's like, you know, that's your story, that's your idea, that's your thoughts, that's your perceptions, but it has nothing to do with whether or not that actually happened because I've heard plenty of people's little t truths that are bs <laughs> you know so it, it you know it's in, it's important to to identify which ones we're talking about when we're talking about that stuff I think that's a big right thing. right so when it comes to like something happening there's a truth in what happens but there's also a truth in like laws absolute capital t truth in these spiritual laws like you mentioned the law of correspondence law of cause and effect these kinds of things mm -hmm. um uh, as as above so below karmic laws. These are just absolute laws that aren't broken. They're not malleable. They can't be changed. It is what we are living in. Laws work 100% of the time. And when we are in harmony with those laws, we receive the blessings of the universe and we see all of the synchronicities and we see all of the magic and we see all of the abundance that takes place and when we are in opposition to the those natural laws and we don't don't accept that they're true and we work against them then we get to see all of the suffering and realize all of the pain uh and the the lack of joy that can be part of this existence too and that the that the universal laws don't care at all which which path you choose because you will learn your lessons Either way, you can learn them in love or you can learn them in suffering. And that's the way it was set up. Yeah, and the it, it, it is so simple. <laughs> this is what I just love about it. It's like, just don't harm anybody. And the fact that it comes down to everything is is about do not steal. Um, so I, I, like, I like to kind of imagine what this world would look like I mean, and I think about all of the ways we have all of these structures and all of these authorities, and all of these institutions and all of these laws and legal system and all of this government and everything because people don't, because people steal. <laughs> and, and then all those institutions also steal. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so if I, I think natural law drives us to live as actualized human beings um, or if we choose not to be actualized, if I choose to, um, okay, if I choose to harm you, let's say I, I, I come onto your property and I cut down one of your trees, like you guys are growing fruit trees and I just go, you know, it's just out of the, the badness of my heart, I chopped out one of your trees. Um, so then I'm stealing from you. I am, I have, I, uh, under natural law, that will come back to me in some way and also 
under natural law, is there some action you would take with me? So, so under natural law, my understanding is that when you choose to act and harm someone else, that you are handing them your right to not be harmed. You are saying, I no longer have this right because I'm going to take an action against you that forfeits my right to that. And so that's where we talk about the difference between force and violence. So self, and self-defense and self-defense, because that's the balance of that whole golden rule principle. It's do no harm, but take no shit. That's the side of it. That <laughs> it, 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 it and that's what we teach our children. That's like we if we don't if we don't have one, we're, we're going to get walked all over. We're going to have some imbalance there. And so we have the, not only the right, but the obligation to defend ourselves and to defend others who are unable to defend themselves. And that means protecting our property or ourselves. And so what I teach my children is when somebody hands you that right to harm them, it doesn't mean that you should do as much harm to them as you can at that point. What it means is that you now have the right to take whatever action is necessary to stop that harm and to stop it from happening again in the future. And so you as a man or a woman have to, make that choice and that determination of what that is and no one else really can decide and so that's where there you know it can be some gray area for some people but if you're operating from the right place in your heart you're going to take the action that you need to take and no more to stop that harm from happening and it could it could be lethal you know if if it comes down to it if you feel like somebody is threatening your family's like livelihood or your life then that might be the level of the force that you need to take to stop that. That's, you know, um, kind of the way that I understand that it works. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of spiritual people might have problem with that. Like, you know, we, we, we should all do the Gandhi thing, you know, we should all just lay down our arms and, and just, um, you know, s surrender to whatever and not mind what happens. Meditate. <laughs> meditate meditate that tree back <laughs> yeah, exactly. and i think it's a choice too you have a choice to take action yeah or not you do you and know. Say, i don't need to do that i don't like i love this person more than this tree and i hope that i can tell just forgive them and and tell them that they shouldn't have done that and maybe that works you know but there's also such a thing out there as psychopaths um, there are people out there that are lacking the prefrontal cortex and don't have a conscience. Uh, we, we see evidence of that all around us. I don't think it's disputable. And so as long as we have those elements in our society, we have to all be willing to, to use appropriate force if necessary, especially if we have a family that we need to defend because, or if there's others, people that are unable to defend themselves. Um, you know, I might be able for myself to choose to lay down, but if my neighbor who can't defend themselves is being harmed and taken advantage of and doesn't want to make that choice, then as their neighbor and their friend, then I have an obligation to step up and to help them defend their property and themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's interesting because, you know, like you said about the government, we're going to, as long as we have people who are thieves, who are doing immoral actions, they're always going to gravitate like towards those positions of power. That's just how it works. And so to say that we need a small group of people to control everyone, to stop some small group of people from doing bad things, well, those, those other bad people are just going, you know, it just makes sense. It's not possible that we're going to have some sort of government that is only good people who are going to make sure everyone is safe and you know it's all going to come down to how we evolve spiritually on our own if we're going to lay down and not defend ourselves well then we're going to continue to be in the position that we're in um, so that part's very important natural yeah, law I, is down ahead. the path to anarchy that's a natural law will take you to the path of understanding anarchy or as we call it voluntarism because people are so triggered by the idea of not having a master and don't like that word anarchy um, but that that is the natural progression of of going to this work and understanding because you start to understand that that authority that is is wielded over us as citizens and people uh, is immoral and that it doesn't actually have any foundation in any natural spiritual law and that all of the, the legal things that are held over us are either redundant because they're already accounted for in natural law 
or they're unnecessary because people, people in general are good. People want to do the right thing. And that's why these systems can exist. People are taught from a young age and we're programmed um, in every aspect that to, to be a good person means that you obey and that you obey. So that's what this like whole schooling system we have. It's not about teaching people critical thinking. It's not teaching people to ask questions. It's teaching people how to give me the answer that I told you I want to hear. And so at a very young age, we start to be conditioned for that. We go into the workforce, we pay taxes, we play the game, we do all these things. And if you speak up and say, wait a minute, like, why am I giving all this money to these people? I, this is a lot, this is a lot of taxes. And people look at you and say, oh, you're bad. Like you're, you're the immoral one you don't want to contribute to to this thing that we've all put together that that supports society and everything and so you're, you want to be a tax cheat you want to you know you want to be a bad person and so this is this is the society we live in people think that following along following the rules paying your taxes playing the game registering for this asking permission for everything all along the way is how you are a good person um, and that's what actually supports us. The government itself doesn't have a lot of power without the millions of people that walk in lockstep with everything they're told and point at somebody who's not doing it as the anomaly and the person who's a, a rebel and needs to be punished or something. Yeah, I, I recently, I get these emails sometimes from um, Quora because I, I read Quora sometimes. Quora is a, a platform where people ask questions and 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 then people go in and answer them. And there's all sorts of different topics. But this one that showed up in my email recently was, it was so random. It had nothing to do with anything I was interested in, but I still clicked on it. And the question was something like, if homeowners associations um, are, are end up being, you know, petty dictatorships, why do, why do we have homeowner associations? Why do people put up with it? And the answer that had the most upvotes was brilliant. It was like, it was kind of like, buckle up honey i'm going to tell you about reality people want dictators they want dictators as long as they had the same taste and values as as they have they want dictators to tell you what to do because they then they don't have to tell you what to do so if a homeowner association wants all the houses to be you know if you want all the houses to be brown or green or purple and you want to, then you tend to want a dictator that'll tell people that it has to be brown or you know blue or purple, and and I started thinking about this. It's so interesting. It's like okay, where does this start? And I started thinking it does start in school. It starts in school when I'm sitting here and Bobby's bugging me. You know, he's throwing paper wads at me, or that, that probably happened in my day. They're probably doing a whole lot worse things now. But or he's pulling my hair or something, and rather than me deal with Bobby. I learned to go to the teacher and say, teacher, teacher, Bobby is bothering me. And I want you to tell Bobby to stop. And we're so ingrained in how to get things done by going to an authority versus talking directly to our neighbor. And it's, it's, it's not just an addiction. It's a, it's so, we're so conditioned. Um, you know, when we have a problem we, with our neighbor, we call the police or something rather than just go knock on the door and say, hey, you know, we're trying to sleep over here. You know, can you keep it down a little bit? No, we call the police or we call some authority. And I completely agree with you. I, I, I'm really just coming out uh, awakening, you know, in the last few years in, uh, in all this. I have not been awakened to all of this, but I'm, it's very clear to me now that, that I was ingrained to respond to authority even if I was kind of like um, kept authority at arm's length, because there's times I was kind of anti-authority, but, but, but we're trained so early to do that. And I think we saw that a lot during, I don't think we have to get into COVID that much, but boy, did we see that, you know, what is, what is Dr. Fauci saying? What is, you know, Dr. Burke saying? What is so-and-so saying? What is so-and-so saying? It's like, just stop, sit with yourself. <laughs> The appeal to, Talk to the divine in you <laughs> and hear what is being said there. And so I guess what I'm saying is I think that it, this is our divine nature to pause and listen to our own inner authority. And it's a muscle that is not very um, toned. On purpose. <laughs> uh, yes, on purpose. I think, I think that what, what, what people what people get confused and what people where they don't see the, the delineation is that we are, we are tribal people. 
we our community is how we thrive people you can survive by yourself and you can you can live a life in the wilderness but bring in a couple more hands bring in a couple more families now you have have the ability to create something more you have the ability to to like use other other people's skill levels and and start to have community and so what we what we crave is we crave leadership and routine and safety and that's kind of the things that that we want and that's what that that natural craving for that that we we want the wisdom of our elders we want leadership we want a council of of wise people to mm -hmm. to determine like a course of action that might make sense for our neighborhood or community or best way to utilize resources um, and because we we work well under that type of a structure because that's kind of is true human nature uh it's co-opted into this idea that we need something that has false authority that we have, if we find enough other friends that agree with us, that we can um, force our ideas on other people in our community that don't agree with those. And so it becomes this game of like, well, I need to find enough other people that I can convince to vote this way, or I can find enough people that will vote for this person who agrees with me. And then we can institute these things we want to do. And, and it's a game of back and forth. And so everybody gets to experience having the other side implement something that they disagree with and that they're uncomfortable with and that they dislike and that they hate but we don't try to change the system because we're told well that's part of it now it's your turn to go find enough of your friends and you find the person with your ideas <laughs> yeah. and we'll put them in. we'll undo all the stuff that they did and then we can start this process over again and make these people mad so that's what ends up happening on a small level and a larger government government level that's kind of what the game is and people are led to believe that authority exists in nature not just even in human nature, but just like in general, there's authority, it exists and we have to follow it. Um, I think that was actually shown really clearly in Mark Passio's documentary on natural law. Um, almost every person that he interviewed said that authority existed in nature, um, that somebody has more rights than another person. <laughs> And it just doesn't really work. Yeah. So in nature, there is there may be hierarchy. Hierarchy, correct. Yeah, but not a not authority. Is that what right. you're saying? Yes. I, yeah, I think that'd be a great way to put it. Yeah. So it's um I, I think I think what we're saying is every in natural law, everybody has the exact same right. Nobody has more. I mean they have more they may have different possessions or different uh yeah. lifestyles or whatever but n nobody has more of a right to do something than another person does and everybody has the right to live freely and to not be harmed yes correct everybody correct. has the right to not be harmed okay so with natural law um i i i, I we could st spend the whole hour talking about natural law but i'm kind of interested in what you're doing with it i'm also interested in your your permaculture and you know everything that you're kind of doing on your farm and and how how you're educating people on natural law and um and just just how you're changing the world in your own way or you're changing your your world in your own way yeah well I, I, one of the biggest things that we've done that i think has had a really big impact is that a couple years ago we started uh hosting events on our property it looks like i'm frozen we started hosting events on our property about every two months and they're basically kind of like a conscious uh retreat and we invite people to come and speak on different topics a lot of times it's people talking about different uh freedom free routes to freedom different uh um, oh. aspects of natural law health uh, permaculture things like that we do a big vegan organic potluck um, after the speakers are done and i as a chef I, I make the main course and we'd make sure that it's a great deal and then we have uh entertainment afterwards so we have a stage with the, the terrace area and a big fire pit and we have people play music and comedy spin fire and then we camp out uh people that want to stay camp out the next morning we do well we do a sound bath that night and then the next morning we do yoga and a sound healing and kind of just hang out with the community and we've been we've had 12 11 our, our next one is in june it'll be our 12th event but what it's really 
we've seen that's been amazing is that people, because our idea was that we have this little stage, we have this little group of people, we want to, to empower people to be teaching, whatever it is that they're knowledgeable about, whatever it is that their gift is, if there's music that they want to share, we wanted to inspire them in a kind of a safe space, not a big crowd, to get up onto a stage and to speak or to sing or to talk. We record everything, we put it on our YouTube channel, and so it all lives there for people to be able to share through their own channels but we've watched a few people really yeah. step out into to themselves and from going from the first time they ever performed being on our stage we have, um, we have a conscious rapper uh, named Alfred Duarte who uh, rapped live for the first time on our stage and he uh, just did a tour with this guy KRS One, who's a pretty yeah. well-known conscious rapper, and he he's opened for him. He's recording an album. Well. He's we got him into a music festival um, last year that he had a great set and performed at. Uh, we've had uh, several people that have uh, started podcasts after they after they spoke on our stage for the first time and kind of or have inspired. now gone on to start speaking, speaking in, in other conferences, in events, and conferences. Uh, we were invited to come and speak at the Greater Reset last year. Um, through our websites, uh, Derek Rose found us through our through our websites and invited us to come and kind of speak about all all this stuff. We we talked about uh, vegan permaculture mostly, but uh, that's that's been the biggest thing, and that's what we really want to inspire people to model is that if you have a space, and even if it was a park or a beach or somewhere where you could just reserve space for a little while, you need a sound system and somebody to organize it, but. People in this community have a lot of knowledge and wisdom. And when you get them all together and this person might know a lot about like energetics and this person might know a lot about, about um, some other thing that people find valuable. Or this person might have a product. There's a lot of health things out there that are really profound that people are becoming knowledgeable about. And just inviting the community to come and be the ones that are teaching and sharing and performing. And we've seen this amazing synergistic uh, network kind of open up and people kind of meeting the person that they needed that could fill in this space for this project that they were working on and we've seen these collaborations happening and these really deep powerful friendships where these people are really excited to come back and see each other and it's a regular thing and all we're doing is kind of holding space and and managing it and so that's been for me one of the most uh i'd say like yeah. fulfilling things we've done because we've really got to see the ripple effect of what it's done like right here in southern california and seeing that that's really a way like we want to have a big platform we want to be out there spreading the message in the world but if we're just inspiring this small group of people who are also action takers and we call them activation events because we want them to leave and do something and, and empowerment so. retreats um it's interesting to me too because at uh, my time at uc santa cruz i taught a class that was called empowering environmental philosophy and i didn't even realize like what part of that it was going to be what how big of a part that would play in my life in the future um and it, it gives me so much satisfaction just to see how much we have empowered some of these people in our community. Um, it's, it's beyond any sort of monetary gain we could ever get from it, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think that, I think that we all, um, I shouldn't speak for you, but I think many of us have this vision of having this big, huge audience and making this huge impact, but it's not how it works. I mean, it works in this ripple effect. It works with starting with communities. That's, that, that's right now. I think there's a lot of people frustrated with what's going on in the world, no matter what side you're on. And I've, I try, I try to be, I'm not on sides anymore. I stopped that. Yeah. <laughs> we don't do sides. You just kind of look at the whole thing and you look at the sides are, are all part of the same thing. But no matter what your view is, I think there's a lot of people frustrated with the world. Um, but it's not like the whole world's going to change. It's not like this whole big avalanche of what's going on with the government and and war and Ukraine and transhumanism and and you know whatever it is, whatever it is that you're bothered about. And some people don't think know that any of that stuff's going on. So whatever it is that you're you're worked up about, um, we we think that that whole world out there needs to change. But what you're doing is is creating a space like a little Woodstock. <laughs> to me, as you're, as you're describing it, it strikes me as a, a Woodstock of of ideas and 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 skills and whatever people are expressions, um, mm -hmm. not necessarily rock bands, but that's how it sounds to me. And 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 you're gathering people in your community, and then that's just this, and, and people finding their voice then. And then yeah. people go out into the world and they change. And, you know, over time, maybe they start their own little woodstocks out there. Anyway, that that's how change happens. And that's how this world is going to change by, yeah. by people doing like what you're doing, just standing on a stage and speaking truth and giving people the stage. Yeah. Yeah, it's, 
it's something that honestly we feel could be modeled everywhere with very and you know you make a space and have some food and people bring things and you know you just connect and and we our first one was kind of like right after COVID started to open back up and the feeling everybody, all these people started showing up and like, oh my God, this is the community I've been looking for. These are the people that I knew were out here. There, there's a lot of people in our community that didn't wake up to anything until COVID. We're literally completely in the matrix, like mm -hmm. no concept of anything being uh, out of place or wrong with the way things were and that that was their wake up call. That That's one of the cool like silver linings of that whole thing I think is that we've just seen a lot of people yeah. that are that step back and are like whoa wait a minute this is not not right something about this doesn't feel right um, you know and and so we we see that that the timing was really divine that it's like right when people needed it the most and they find these people and they're like oh gosh like I, I needed this I knew it was out here somewhere and I've been looking for you guys and and um, so I would just encourage everybody out there to it's not that hard a sound system is cheap you know you get a get a couple microphones something to plug into and you're good to go and there's our, our people that that have things to talk about and, and share and, and even if you started just like a, a forum for conversation that was like more curated and just had some topical discussion that would be huge because yeah. people have things on their heart people want to share things and um and teach and another thing that's fun um and easy to do if you have the space is to do like documentary movie nights and have conversations that follow that i like to use this format called world cafe um where you split the group up into smaller groups and everybody has tea um, to help stimulate our conversation and there's a series of questions that's gone through and one person stays at the table for each question and then the rest of the group gets up and switches to a different table so you give everybody the opportunity to speak because not everyone is comfortable speaking in front of a larger group so if you have a small group of three or four people it really encourages that conversation and then you can come back around in the end and discuss where everybody was at with it. Cool. Interesting. Uh, that might be something I try at my retreat. That sounds really interesting. Yeah. Um, okay. So I, I want to make sure we have time to talk about permaculture and how this, how, you know, what is permaculture and how does it fit into everything else that you're doing? Yeah. Um, you know, permaculture is an interesting word. It's not necessarily like, I, I don't know, I haven't really landed on the best word for it. I like different terms um, as well, but it's but the basic idea is like, how do we continue our culture in, and make it a permanent thing in the sense that it is sustainable, that we're gonna be able to continue living in this way without causing harm to the planet. Um, to our soils, that's probably one of the most important factors because the soil, it comes first and everything comes from that. Um, and so we're talking about how we design our homesteads, how we design maybe even just a garden um, or a whole community. And we can look at it in all these different levels. Uh, as far as like your homestead, you're gonna wanna look at your zones and your property and where you, where the sun gets in the most for your garden, how close it is to your home as far as the um, you know, ease of use to you. And a lot of people have this perception, especially within the permaculture and biodynamic world that you cannot have a sustainable system without animal agroecology. And I've heard that a it's lot. It's just, yeah, it's just a fallacy. Um, people have been, you know, growing food without animal inputs for a pretty long time. Agricultural, and, animal uh, agricultural and animal inputs, because that's the thing is that animal inputs are everywhere. We can't, you know, if your soil is healthy, it's full of worms and full of worm poop. Both. And that's what you need, you know, and, and if you have a diversity of plants, then you're going to bring in a diversity of birds and other insects. And things of that nature we um there it's actually it's very interesting too when you look at um, plant health and how insect predation occurs whether it's um like a beneficial insect or non-beneficial insect um plants actually give out like a distress call 
uh, these insects and that come and attack your plants are doing it because they can see that there is something unhealthy about that plant and they go for it. They know that they can eat it. Now, if the plant is actually healthy and at its strongest point, all of these systems are in balance, then those insects actually cannot even penetrate with their, their jaws into the leaf or into the fruit. Um, so it, it like naturally repels those insects when it's in its most balanced state. Interesting. I did not know that. And I'm guess, I guess I'm kind of wondering if that works with, um, what is it called? Invasive species. <laughs> we, have, <laughs> we have problems with um, Japanese beetles. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> My husband's been trying, we've been trying to grow grapevines for years and the Japanese beetles just completely destroy the leaves. But so tell me, tell me, is well, it, well, is well, it well, just the health of the plant? Well, I mean, the soil, yeah. really, because the, the, if the soil is healthy, the plant will be healthy. And that's what we've kind of worked backwards yeah. to come to understand. Is we've, we've had this grove, and citrus is notorious for having so many different things that can attack it, whether it's the mold, whether it's a fungus, whether it's an insect, whether it's a, a, a mite, whatever it is, there's all these different things that could come in. And so you could be, treat, it's kind of like medicine, you could be treating all these symptoms, and you could be feel like, okay, I got to spray this on this because of this, and I've got to put this in the soil. I gotta think. But really, if you do the right work, to analyze the soil to find out what it is that you're depleted in and you you fix that and it could take a couple seasons but that when the soil is correct the plant will start to get everything that it needs from the soil and when the plant is healthy it doesn't allow room for these things to happen and so it's like you might have to do something to stop something that's attacking but that the real solution is just like in medicine to go find the root cause and then the root cause with the plant is where the roots are <laughs> and so that's what if your soil's good your plants will be good and that's that's really okay. the truth okay to, so uh, this is the this is the exact same thing with a human body <laughs> where yeah, the, the this same. whole terrain versus germ theory and and if our if our terrain if our body is healthy we don't get sick when right. we are sick it's our body purging toxins and mm -hmm. it's it's naturally doing that because it's full of all the poisons from mm -hmm. the pesticides and and from well I mean, only mention the pesticides. The pesticides are interesting because this, the root causes the soil, and no one's doing that. They're adding <laughs> pesticides, which are making us sick <laughs> because our terrains are weak. Yeah, this so, is this huge cycle that is not. It is not continuing our culture. It's not permaculture. So go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say it's it's so much more than just pesticides. Um, I've found over the years that people have a really big misconception on what is conventional agriculture versus organic agriculture. And I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard somebody be like, well, wait, what do you mean? You can't just wash off the pesticides. It doesn't just wash away. And I go, no, it's systemic within the plant. And it goes down to the soil they, and even the seeds. Um, manufacturers will coat the seeds in things to help them, you know, sprout, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's healthy for the plant or for the soil or for us. Um, they also will fumigate the soils with toxins to try to kill anything within the soil. Um, and I, I mean, at that point, the soil is only good for holding the plant up. So, so you mentioned how the, in the freedom community, the, there, there's a big disconnect and blockage to the idea of, of eating plant-based and how that's an integral part of uh, freedom. Uh, but I would say that in the, the vegan and plant-based community that there's still a big block to the idea of how uh, essential eating organic is. Yeah. And that w if we're gonna have all this care for the animals and all this care for the planet and this care for ourselves, that we have the choice when we're, when we're getting food at the market it's very clear choice. If it says organic on it, it's not been sprayed with poison. If it doesn't say organic on it, it probably has poison in it. And people don't take that into heart and understand that this is a this is a consciousness thing. This is about like this is our vessel for our consciousness, and that what we put into it is our fuel. It is it, we are what we eat. So if we're gonna choose with our our free will choice to put things in our body that actually are harming us, even though we think we're making a good choice because it's plant based or it's got like nutritious things in it, that we're actually like actively harming ourselves. We're harming our consciousness, and so we're harming all of us. 
And so it's like this idea that we have to also embrace that, that we have the responsibility to choose to take in organic food in every aspect whenever possible. And for some people that might seem like it's a lot, but the reality is it's just an idea of like okay if i draw my line here and this is where i'm at and only if i have to to survive will i take in something that's not just like with water i won't drink water that's not reverse osmosis i would rather be thirsty if i'm dying in the desert i'll drink some dirty water but until then i would used to be thirsty and bypass water that i don't know how it's been filtered or because i don't want to like intentionally take in poison it doesn't make sense to me i do all this other work on myself why would i do that uh, the disconnect is really interesting to me i've seen it now for so long um even before we chose to go 100% plant-based, you know, for so long, all the vegan like alternative options in the market are not organic. And you'll see companies that has a non-vegan product and a vegan product, and their non-vegan one will be organic, but their vegan one will not be. And I'm like, do you only care about one or the other? I mean, it, it goes back to like, Rachel Carson days, one of the original environmentalists. And she found that DDT goes all the way up the chain to these birds of prey where it was thinning their eggshells and their babies could not survive. And so this, like I said, it's systemic. It's not just systemic within the plant, it becomes the entire environment. So it's not just about you know, not eating those animals, but if you're, if you're choosing to not eat those animals because you don't want to harm those animals, then don't use products as well that are going to go up that food chain and harm the animals too. Yeah. And I think, I think we also, when we look at systemic issues, I mean, I go, I, I buy organic fruits and vegetables to the extent that I can. Um, and they're very expensive <laughs> compared yeah. to the alternative. Now, I am fortunate. I can oh. I can buy it. Some people yeah. are really struggling and really can't. And I think it's because some some things over here are subsidized. You know, some things over here are subsidized, and other things that are really healthy for us are not. And you know, that's kind of a bigger systemic issue. But um, but mm -hmm. but but uh, what you're doing is is doing this local stuff. So you're you've got your own fruits and your own farm and I presumably you're right. selling your stuff with our restaurant like you know I source all of the products organic and so I get to comparison shop and see and there's sometimes some of the products I get are three times as expensive as an organic version from the same company and that's that's absolutely true I use an organic gluten-free soy sauce and it costs three times as much as that same company's just plain not gluten-free soy sauce and so if you start stacking through all these different items and seeing that like it's a huge just rice organic rice versus non-organic rice it's three to four times um mm -hmm. it's expensive and so yeah there's there's definitely uh, something out there that's trying to to make it hard for people to um, to make these choices it's sad because really organic certification people want to say it's very expensive and it's not that expensive and if you're choosing to grow organically you're probably not going to be putting as many chemicals and things on your which cost money plants which cost money and so okay. really it's the more expensive way to go it's more of like the marketing the marketing oh, okay that, all right good that, to know all right yeah it kind of makes sense you you have to care for your soil probably more but you're not yeah. paying for all those chemicals yeah and once you get the soils and everything in balance you're going to need less and less inputs in other ways um, okay. Interesting. And then All right. of course, you know, it depends on where you live, California, where we are, um, we're the organic capital of the entire country. <laughs> I know it's growing in other States as well, but if you live in the Bay area of California, like about 90% of the organic food for the whole country comes from the Bay area of California and prices are a lot better there when you go to the farmer's markets versus even just coming down to Southern California to a farmer's market. And I didn't even want to buy a lot of strawberries when I compared the prices. Oh, interesting. So, As you guys are closer to the equator, I would think. <laughs> I think the, the solution, well, one of the solutions is it's like, honestly, like if, if more people would just make that decision, like you said, like whenever possible when I do it, this is what I'm going to seek out. This is what I want. Mm -hmm. You already see in all of the grocery stores, we have the specific ones we go to that kind of are niche and mostly organic, but even I go to any like Albertsons, Kroger, whatever, they have a pretty big organic produce section oh, yeah. that didn't used to exist a few oh, years yeah. ago. So we know the demand, <laughs> no people want that. And so 
the more that people want that and the more people turn their backs on this other stuff, well, if nobody wants this other product that they're growing, then then they're going to stop putting their energy and effort into producing it and they're going to all shift and that's going to just become the standard of what we all decide that like this is what we've decided as a society that we want to eat this way. And I think that the price of it all would go down and reflect that, although all the prices are going up. So I don't know right. if that will actually uh, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's another podcast. <laughs> but but I do I do think that um, recognizing that our body is our temple, our body is our temple. This is it's housing our very being. It's housing the energy of our soul, whatever it is that we want to call it, the eternal nature of us, our consciousness, and and we're 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 putting poison into it. And it's because it's invisible. We just don't recognize it all. I, years and 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 years, decades, I didn't go do organic. It's really only the last several years. So my body's full of this stuff, you know? And if I get sick every six months, I'm, I'm happy as anything because I'm getting some of the stuff out of me, <laughs> you know? it's it, Whatever it is that's in me is coming out. Um, I shouldn't say I'm happy being sick, but it's working, you know? because it's not, it's not what belongs in us. So, okay, so we've done natural law, permaculture. Uh, we've, we've learned about your, your Woodstock of ideas, that, according to me. <laughs> and um, so we've got a few more minutes, just a couple more minutes. So I wanna give you the opportunity to say anything else you might not have shared today about what you're doing. I don't know, uh, we didn't, ever, didn't really talk about homeschooling, but if you got a couple more minutes, what else would you like to say? Um, well, I. I think it's important to just keep doing what you love doing, find where you can apply natural law to your livelihood, and we call it right livelihood. And even if it takes you struggling, because you know we're not getting rich off of what we're doing, um, it's more about starting to take that action and making it happen. And we're seeing it reflected in other ways, you know, like with when we go out with our restaurant, just the amount of positive feedback that we get, it's, I mean, it makes us want to cry how often it happens because you know, he worked at a restaurant for so long and he never had people coming back into the restaurant to give you a gift and say, oh. hey, thank you so much for providing this food. You know, that part, it just, it feels so good to know that we're, we are taking that right livelihood. Um, whether or not it's it's schooling our children or our restaurant or our retreats as far as homeschooling goes i'd, I'd touch on that really quickly we we knew like really before we had children that that putting them in a public school situation would Never be an had, option but... and in california you can't go to a private school unless you're up to date on all public your medium. your shots and so uh that was never going to be an option for us anyway but uh the and a lot of people don't think that they could pull that off doing homeschooling. But what we found is within our community that there's some families that want that same thing they want to homeschool, but they can't do it themselves. They have a job, they have things they can't. And we've got a little co-op that we have where some, some people bring their children and compensate us for that. And we were able to be at home with our kids and some other kids in the community teaching them. And, and uh, it's been pretty amazing because it forces us to be really good parents um we, we we have to come up with a, a lesson plan we have to come up with arts and crafts and we have to come up with what's our snack we're going to prepare today and all these put a lot of like thought and effort into kind of to repairing a day um for our our children and we're able to to have a relationship with them that i i never imagined that i'd be able to be there from the beginning of the day till the end of the day and put them to bed and be there for all of the sports and all of the activities and everything else and um really just working outside of that saying okay this is what's important this is what we're going to do and then we're going to figure out all the things around that that can fit into that that can help support us and maintain this but that like really our priority is supporting our our, our farm and our our children and creating something here that they can they can have for long after we're gone and um that's what we're what we're focused on you guys are living the life <laughs> it's hard work it's a lot of work <laughs> yeah i'm sure it is i'm sure it is and i think that you know it's interesting um i think that people have in their mind that people who homeschool are um uh fundamentalist christians or something like that you know that's not it's not my experience i mean there's all sorts of people out there doing homeschooling i had a whole whole episode with Edith Ubuntu Chan. I don't know if you know her, but she did a, uh, she did a, I did an episode with her. She, all the stuff that they're doing with all these different options of, of educating children 
is so fascinating yeah. and so right. much more creative and so much more natural than what we're doing with the public schools. Yeah. yeah it's and I want to encourage families as well to know that it's it is possible to do it because we meet so many people who are like, well, I just don't have the time for that. And they don't understand what it really takes. And, um, you know, you don't, you don't have to go to the government websites, but if you want to go to them in California, you can see that there's not actually any laws around homeschooling. It's all just suggestion. Um, and so you can make it however you want to make it. And I encourage families to reach out to their community because you never know, you might find someone who is doing something like we are, who does have that space to be able to host the school um, and, and make it something that's like, oh, wow, now actually this is easy. This is achievable for me. I yeah. can take it somewhere where I know that we're going to be safe and not have some government trying to teach our kids what's right and wrong. And that there's lots of people like you out there. Like we, yeah. we found that very quickly, just like the universe is going to bring the like-minded people into your path and the people that are going to resonate with what it is that you, you believe and understand. And uh, there's, but you have to take some action too. If yeah. that's what you want, that you can't just sit and wait for it to happen, that you have to go to the places where those people are going to be at. And you have to put yourself into the groups online where you're having conversations, where you find somebody that's aligned with you. And then you start a chat yeah. offline and find out that they live a few miles away and they have kids that are in the same age group and stuff. And we've found that very quickly um, that those types of people are everywhere and they're wanting to find you too. And so don't, don't feel like you're on an Island and that you're the only person in your neighborhood or your community that feels the way you do or believes the things you do because we are everywhere. And that's a fact. I love that. That's, that's the, the high, high side of the internet, <laughs> our yeah, ability exactly. to find each other. It's fascinating. Exactly. I have yeah, friends right. all over the world that people think, oh, those are just Facebook friends or whatever kind of friend. No, these are real friends. When I'm in town, we see each other and, you know, it, it's fascinating. Yeah. Well, you guys, you're doing such interesting work. I, 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 I shouldn't say you're, you're living, you're living your life. You know, you're, you're living, you're allowing life to live through you in a complete alignment with who you are. And it's, um, it, it shouldn't be rare. Um, it is still inspiring and admirable. My hope is that someday it won't be inspiring and admirable because everyone's doing it. <laughs> Me too. <Yeah. laughs> That'd be great. Yeah. Well, let's just manifest. I'm sorry? I just said, let's just manifest that then. Let's just That's manifest that. Let's just manifest that. Back to uh, taking action under natural law, right? Because we can't just be new age spiritualists saying we're going to manifest it. We have to put our feet on the ground and make that happen. That's a great ending point. We can't just be new age spiritual people. <laughs> We've got to make it happen. And that's what we're here to do. I think we're here to bring heaven to earth. I, I think we are. I think we're here to, to bring the divine in each one of us complete, completely fully expressed here. And it, it, it's going to be a beautiful planet. It is already. It is already. We just got to keep working. Yes, I agree. Okay. Well, Paul and Lauren, thank you so much. And I, I don't know how this is going to record because I think our internet was kind of in and out a little bit. So I'm hoping it, it's going to end up looking okay, um, sounding okay. And thank you to all the listeners who were with us today. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, thank you, Paul and Lauren. We'll be following your work and have all the links on our page. Awesome. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks so much for inviting us. It was a pleasure. Yeah, All right. You yeah. too. Okay. I now close the spiritual forum.